Hello everybody, happy Friday. Hope everyone is ready for the long weekend. I definitely am. So I won't keep you much longer than I have to today to share with you some very fun information. Uh, there was a couple of people that emailed me wanting to know a little bit more about ETFs. We've covered them in the past. So we've talked about what an ETF is, how you use them as part of your investment strategy. But today, I want to talk a little bit more about them. For some of you, this may be review, but I want to share with everybody a new tool that I found that is very, very helpful in finding your options. Because remember, the point of an ETF is to give you, it's like a gift basket, where you go to the market and instead of wanting to buy a bar of chocolate, a bag of nuts, and then some stuff here and there, you buy the entire gift basket already wrapped where you know that you get to buy it and that they'll like it. So I hopefully they like it. So that's what I want to share with you today. I want to share the different gift baskets there are, how you can compare them, how you can find the right gift basket for you, and how they can be part of your trading strategy, whether it be stocks, commodities, bonds, Forex currencies, and more. So that is going to be the topic of today's webinar. As always, please let me know if you have any questions in the chat. We'll be watching the chat, and hopefully we can answer those questions live. If we can't answer them live, then we will definitely answer them over email at our email support at sectorsmadesimple.com. Always the easiest way to get a hold of us. And I would appreciate it if you can all subscribe to the channel. So YouTube knows that you all love us very much, and also so you make sure that you never miss out on the upcoming webinar. Without any further ado, let's get to today's presentation. So I wanted to start today where we've started many of these presentations with the very simple basics. What is a fund? Before we get into what an exchange traded fund is, we first need to talk about what a fund is. A fund is a simple type of investment where it's like buying a little gift basket. Now, much like you would go to the market and you may buy the kind of fruit basket where inside of it, it's all a bunch of different types of fruits. You may get the one for that chocolate lover in your family that's all different types of chocolate. So most funds will specialize in something. So they'll have... They'll be the same kind of basket. So it'll be your chocolate lover's basket or your fruit arrangement or your flowers. So they'll all have something in common. Now, there's different types of funds. There's not just your mutual funds and your exchange traded funds. Um, can everyone see the screen? Is Are you able to see it? Okay, cool. Um, Kike, let me know if you're still having trouble. I can see if I can help out. Or maybe Kira or Vero would be able to help you. So there's a couple of main types of funds. The first is an opened-end fund. This is your mutual fund, or this is your... Ex most exchange-traded funds would be open funds, where they don't have, for example, they don't say you can only have 10 million shares or sorry, $10 million of shares. So you can buy in, and if you're not part of that 10 million, sorry, open-ended, there's always room for more. Come on, bring the friends, bring the family. They can invest as much as they can gather. Then there's the closed-end funds. These are the guys who, you know, it's a secret club. You've got to be in the know. Or you have to buy in. And the only way that you can get in after their initial public offering, once they've already sold all of their shares, is to buy somebody else's share. So think of it like you're going to the movies. There's only so many seats, or going to a sporting event, there's only so many seats around. And if you didn't get to buy the seat before they sold out, the only way you can buy a, new, or buy a seat in that showing, or in that baseball game, whatever it may be, is to buy somebody else's seat. So that is what a closed end fund is. There's, they have their sell off at one point. If you got in, great. If you didn't, the only way you're getting in is if you buy someone else's spot. 
Then there's what's called a UIT or a unit investment trust. These are funds that they follow very, very strict rules. They tell you, this is how I invest. I don't I don't make the rules, I just follow them. Those are these kinds of funds. Their goal isn't to make the most money, it's to perform as close to whatever they're tracking or whatever their units are invested into as possible. So unit investment trusts are like many types of ETFs that they will track a specific index where if that index is improving, you would expect for you to be making some cold hard cash. Then the last is private funds. These are funds that you may need to apply to get into. They may have requirements, such as I believe Morgan Stanley has one, that the entry level requirement, the only way you can get in is if you invest at least $10 million. Kerry, you got $10 million sitting around. You want to invest in a private fund with me? I don't know. I was, you never know. Everyone might have a little bit of cash hidden underneath the bed. But private funds, they'll usually have requirements. They'll have certain things that you need to meet in order to even receive an invitation to be a part of these funds. So what I want to focus on today is what type of funds most of you would be looking at when looking at sectors made simple or looking at sectors which is going to be our open-ended funds and our unit investment trusts that we can lump into one group called exchange traded funds or short ETFs. These are either open-end or unit investment funds that invest in a specific market or an index. So for example, they may invest in Japanese companies, or they may invest in green energy, or they may invest in the material sector. So each of these ETFs will specialize in one specific market or index where their goal is not to make the most money, it's to mimic or follow the performance of their index, whatever they're tracking. So if the index went up by 1% value, you would want your investment to go up by 1% value as well. And the beauty of this is it's your gift baskets. It is a way of getting diverse portfolios, so a lot of different stocks that are bought and sold by somebody or by the rules that they follow of different stocks, bonds, drips, currencies, commodities, the list goes on and on. But the best part about these is unlike a mutual fund, where most mutual funds, the only way you can buy into a mutual fund is you wait until the stock market closes at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Then the mutual fund will say, all right, who wants to join in? The price is set at $15. And then people can buy shares into that mutual fund at $15 a share. ETFs are different. ETFs, you can go onto the New York Stock Exchange and you can buy a share of, I'm going to use the example, XLK. You can go buy a share of XLK and put it right next to your shares of Apple and Microsoft. So they can be bought and sold like actual stocks and bought and sold on exchanges alongside other stocks. But unlike stocks, ETFs do come at a cost. You're sold. No. They come at the cost of what's called an expense ratio. It is their administrative fee. So just like when you go and you buy a basket at Ralph's, you may buy $10 worth of stuff in the gift basket, but the gift basket costs $10.50. That $0.50 cents is Ralph's cut for putting that gift basket together for you. And many of these ETFs, oh, all of these ETFs, charge expense ratios. The fees may be very, very small for some ETFs, and we'll look at some of these fees later even down to 0.03%. Some may be as high as 1%, depending on a couple of things, mainly the type of um, index that they're tracking, so the complexity of the index they're tracking, or more importantly, how managed that portfolio is. 
Some things like an equal weighted index where they just buy one of everything in the market and that's that. Very, very easy. They follow that simple rule. I wanna buy, I wanna be like Buddha. I wanna be one with everything. And then there's others that we'll talk about in a bit that are leveraged ETFs where they're gonna be looking not just at buying stocks, but trading options, taking debts, collecting debts, and trying to increase the value in these alternative types of investments. If that doesn't make a lot of sense right now, don't worry, we'll go through all of this in the rest of this presentation. But there's a lot of choices when it comes to ETFs. You don't just have your chocolate or your fruit basket. You have over 1,800 different ETFs that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ alone. Then there's all sorts of ETFs outside of the US, but we're gonna focus on just the US ETFs for today. And I touched on it a little bit, but let's go into a little bit more detail about ETFs versus mutual funds, because these are the two types of funds most people would be looking at. Mutual funds, like I said before, are typically only sold after the market closes. The market closes, the fund takes how much money they're worth, divides it by the number of shares, and they say, okay, you can now buy more shares at this price. And then you have the option to buy it. ETFs can be traded on an index throughout the entire day. So you may have the option of buying them at nine o'clock in the morning or at two o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern time, of course. And the main difference though, is most mutual funds are what's called actively managed, which means that somebody's job is to wake up in the morning, put on a suit and tie, go to the office, and go and try and make as much money for their company as they can, or as much money for their portfolio as they can. That's their job. So someone needs to pay them for them doing that job. And the person that pays them is the shareholders. It's the people that invest in that fund. But ETFs, most of them aren't actively managed. They're what's called passively managed. Because we talked about before, they follow rules. Usually those rules will say what to buy and sell. So it's not someone's job to go in and make all these trades throughout the day. The ETF kind of works on its own. It kind of runs itself. And because of that, there's a lot less fees and the fees that are charged are a lot lower. Now, the beauty of ETFs is we don't get to just buy into them we get to know what they're buying. So all ETFs, or most ETFs, I believe, publish what's called holdings, or what's in their gift basket. So you get a list of all of the different things that that ETF has in their gift basket. So you could say, oh, well, I know that this ETF owns 30% of their portfolio is Apple. Hmm, Apple's looking pretty good. Or say, you know, I already own Apple and Microsoft, so let me look at ETFs that hold those two companies and then see what else they're buying. So maybe I can buy those stocks as well. So that's the beauty of ETFs, is not just the ability to buy into them, but the fact that they're all in that nice clear wrapper that you can look inside and see, ooh, Cadbury chocolate bar, mm, my favorite. And if you want, go out and buy that chocolate bar instead of buying the whole basket. And the last thing I wanna say is, while most mutual funds try and sit there and make as much money as they can, ETFs, a good ETF, the best ETF is the one that can follow their index or whatever they're tracking perfectly. And we'll see how some of them get very close, while others may fall a little bit short of that mark. Now, there are different types of exchange-traded funds. We're not just talking the different sectors here. We're talking if you were looking at companies where you would have equities. So you're looking at specific companies, tracking specific market segments. So maybe technology or discretionary or staples. All of these are different equities that ETFs track. But then there's also bonds. They're 
are ETFs that invest in short-term U.S. bonds. There are ETFs that invest in long-term bonds, which all of these will have different return periods that you would be looking at. So they may buy bonds that won't that won't uh, expire for 20 years, but they're all looking at or following one specific thing so that you can get involved in whatever that small niche market is. There are ETFs that track currency, both specific currency, so for example, track the US dollar, or even track conversion rates of the US dollar to the euro, or the US dollar to the pound, or the pound to the euro, so on and so forth. Then there's commodities, which are specific product markets, such as you could buy cattle, you could buy oil, you could buy gold, you could buy silver, so on and so forth. And a subsection of the equity market is the sectors, tracking specific industries or sectors where within technology you, you may have semiconductors. So you can find an ETF that trades the semiconductor industry. And these are only the main categories. Many other categories exist. And I'll show you a tool so you can look at all of these different categories and not only see what categories there are, but what ETFs fall into those categories. Now, why have I why have I spoken for the past 10 minutes, 15 minutes about all this crazy stuff? It's because all of these are different options. These are choices that you have. Where while we've looked at this kind of chart, I've shown you this economic cycle in previous webinars where some sectors will perform better in different points in the economic cycle, whether we're in an economic recovery, economic peak, uh, recession, so on and so forth, just like there's different sectors that perform well in these different markets, there's also different asset classes or different types of investments where, for example, in a recovery market, stocks may be very, very strong, whereas when the market is kind of stagnating and the market is not really growing, it's kind of hit its peak and is starting to fall backwards, other things such as, you know, cash or currencies may become a very valuable investment. So there are different opportunities in different markets. It's not just what stock or what sector is the best in this market. It's is stocks even the best thing to be investing in at all. So that's the options that ETFs give you. But it all comes down to choices. There's not only different indexes that you can follow, but even in some indexes, there's multiple ETFs that track the same uh, index or the same market. So what, what makes them different? How do I know which one is better? So that's where we come to what I'll show you in a little bit here, which call, is called the ETF comparison tool. It lets us compare the different kind of, the different ingredients in the gift baskets. What's the basket made out of? How much extra do you have to pay to get that basket? So some of the different things that we'll look at are the expense ratios, which is how much do they charge you? How closely they track their specific index? If they have any partnerships or ownership by brokers, which means that maybe they'll waive that expense ratio, or you don't have to be charged a brokerage fee for purchasing them, so on and so forth. And then there's what's called leveraged and shorted. Leveraged means for every dollar the index goes up or for every 1% the index goes up, if you had a two times leveraged ETF, it would go up 2%. And then on the opposite side of things, say you think the market's gonna go down. You can buy what's called a shorted ETF, which means that if the market goes down by 1%, your shorted ETF goes up by 1%. And the last one is dividends. Many of these ETFs will still pay dividends, so you can compare the different ETFs to see which ones pay dividends, if that's more your style of investing. And the last is rating. Just like bonds, ETFs are rated based on the quality of that ETF. 
This is not as important, so it's not going to be something we put a lot of emphasis on, but it's a difference that is worth noting when we're looking at why different ETFs exist. So I want to just show a quick example of the S&P 500 large cap index. That is the S&P 500 that we all know and love. Where within that single index, we can see different holdings. Where one ETF, SPY, has an expense ratio of 0.09%. So annually, they would take out 0.09% of your value as their fee. Now you think that's pretty good until you maybe see what iShares has. iShares has their ticker IVV that also tracks the S&P 500, but this one charges a little bit less. This one's expense ratio is only 0.04. All right, now we're looking pretty good. Well, there, there's Vanguard. Vanguard's ticker for the S&P 500 is VOO. They charge an expense ratio of 0.0. 3%. So three different ETFs, all tracking the same index, all with different ETF ratios or expense ratios. And we'll look at returns in a little bit here. But let's answer the question, how do I find the right ETF? What is the right ETF for me? Well, the first thing you want to do is find the index that you want to invest in. That's where something like Sectors Made Simple's matrix comes in handy, where it lets you look at the entire market and see what sectors are performing the best. While we do use the State Street Spider ETFs on the matrix because we need to compare something, there are other options within those different markets. Because the Spider ETFs only look at the S&P 500. So it only looks at the 500 largest companies in the New York Stock Exchange. But the market's a lot bigger than that. So other ETFs may invest in the technology sector, but for the entire New York Stock Exchange. So it gives you a lot bigger of a net or a lot bigger of a basket to be looking at. Then what we want to do is once we find what index we want to track, let's look at the different ETFs that trade that index. So we can find what ETF makes the most sense or works for us. There are different websites that you can use for this, but I'm going to show two today, which are ETF.com and ETFDB.com. But there's also other ones such as Morningstar.com if you have a subscription there as well as Finance Yahoo that offer more information for ETFs, but I'm not going to be covering those as much today. And again, the beauty of ETFs is many of them can be bought and sold like a stock alongside other stocks in your investment portfolio. So once you find the right ETF, just, you can go and buy it. Go to your broker and say, I want to buy $500 worth of shares in VOO. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Your ETFs can be put alongside other stocks in your investment portfolio. And again, the fun of ETFs is it's clear plastic. You can look inside of the basket and see what that company or what that ETF is holding. So you can even consider buying those. So let's go back to those two words that I was talking about before. Leverage and short. Let's first talk about shorting. Shorting is a term that is not unique to just um, ETFs. It's something that also exists on stocks. It is the idea of buying without buying. So you say, I will purchase this share for this amount sometime in the future. So if the price goes up, you now have to buy it at that higher price. If it went down, you still have a guarantee that you can buy it at that lower price. 
So it is the option to buy or to make money when the market loses money. So to put this into an example of stock of ETFs rather, a standard ETF that tracks their index would follow this rule. If the index goes up by 1%, a perfect ETF should go up by 1% as well. And this involves investments that rely on securities going up, or what's called a long investment, whereas short investments rely on securities going down. So what will happen is it will have the opposite effect, where if the market goes up by 1%, you would go down by 1%. But if the market goes down by 1%, you go up. And say this is something that sounds good. You know, in, for example, March, shorting was a pretty good option, where everything was tanking, securities were all hitting the toilet. Shorting became one of the best opportunities. But to actually start buying and short, well, I guess shorting companies like you would normal stocks, it's not as simple as going to your broker and saying, hey, go buy me a bunch of shares of Apple. You, you need a special trading account, what's called a margin account. So there's extra steps required to even start shorting uh, stocks. So inverse ETFs, not only give you the option of betting that the market is going to go down and giving you profits if it does, but it, it makes it easy to get involved in these shorting opportunities where you don't need to make a margin account if you want to short, if you just buy an ETF that shorts that index. So inverse ETFs allow investors the opportunity to make profit when the market loses. But because shorting involves a little bit more, like we said, it requires a margin account. In this case, these tend to have much higher fees than a normal long position ETF would. Now, the second choice that you have when it comes to ETFs is leverage. Leveraged ETF is the idea of there's more risk and more reward. Just like normal ETFs, leveraged ETFs will track a specific index where they'll follow, for example, the S&P 500 technology sector. But instead of it just being a single percent where if the market goes up by 1%, your ETF goes up by 1%, leveraged ETFs will have what's called a multiplier that will say how much more volatile they will be. So for example, a two times leveraged ETF will have two times the profit, but also two times the losses as a non-leveraged. So if the S&P 500 technology sector went up by 1%, a 2x leveraged ETF would go up by 2%. Sounds pretty good, right? Per market goes up by 1%. I, I made 2%. That was a good day. But the opposite is also true, where if the market goes down by, let's say, 2%, you go down by 4%. So more risk, more reward. And this isn't just one or the other. It's either shorted or leveraged or neither. There's some that are both. You can find a 2x, a minus 2x sector ETF, which means that when you buy it, if the market goes down by 1%, you go up by 2%. A good example is the ticker symbol SDS, which is a two times leveraged inverse ETF. Kind of crazy stuff, I know, but this is just a good, a good summary of it all. I wanted to give you guys the full picture because now I'm going to show you how you can look at this. So let's get started somewhere very, very simple. Let's start by going to ETF.com. And I want to show you the ETF comparison tool. So here we can see different ETFs that we can compare. I'm going to take this suggested one that they have here, 
which is going to be the Spider S&P 500 ETF and IVV, the iShares S&P 500 ETF. And now we can compare the two where we see who owns it, how much they charge you. So State Street charges you almost 0.1%. BlackRock only charges you 0.03%. How much they trade, how much they own. Here's the important one. What is the underlying index or what is the what do they track? If we're looking if we want to compare apples to apples, we want to make sure that the indexes match up. So here we see that both of these are trading the S&P 500 as their index. And then if we scroll down, this stuff is not as important. What I want to really show you is this, the relative performance or how much money have they actually made? Because when they're both looking at the S&P 500, I said before how it's all them trying to get as close to the market as they could. So here we can see exactly that. We can see how SPY has done in the past compared to IVV, where we see consistently that SPY tends to outperform IVV in the short term by about 0.5% in the three months, year to date almost 1.7%, Oh, I'm so glad, Kike. I'm glad that you can see. Um, and then we see over the past few years, it's consistently about 2% better performance. So this goes to show, yes, you're paying a little bit more for that expense ratio, but you are making higher returns on your investment. And now here's my favorite part of all of this comparison is the holdings. This is where you get to see what these ETFs have, what is in their gift baskets. So here we can see that all of these ET all of sorry, all of these companies are held in this ETF. And this percentage you see is the percent of that gift basket that is Apple or the percent that is Microsoft. You can see that IVV owns a little bit more Microsoft than it, or sorry, a little bit more Apple than Spy does. But for example, Spy owns a little bit more Facebook than IVV. But it's all pretty similar because again, they are not buying and selling to make the most money. They're buying and selling to get the closest to the index that they can. So that is the ETF comparison tool, and we'll come back to that a couple of more times throughout the rest of this presentation. What I want to show you now is where you get creative. This is where I say, go bananas, explore, and see what is out there, because it's a big world. So now we're going to go to ETFDB.com. And the first thing I want to show you is the database. The database is their kind of phone book for all of the different ETFs that are around, where it's a very, very easy way to see not only what markets you can invest in. So say, for example, I want to invest in bonds. I want to invest in junk bonds. There's 47 different ETFs in the junk bond market alone. All right, maybe I don't want to, I don't care about what types of bonds. I just want to look at ones that are about to expire, which are ultra short terms. Well, there's that right there. Or, and let's bring this all back to why we're looking at this, which is most likely sectors. Let's look at our different market sectors. Well, it's not just one choice. The utility sector alone has 25. Telecommunications, which is communications, has nine. And technology is the leader with, with variety at 84. 
So let's, let's click into one of these and see what we get when we look at technology. So I'm going to click here, and now we are looking at all of these ETFs in the technology kind of category. Now, it is worth noting that not all of these are trading the exact same thing. Here we can see the industry that they track. This isn't the whole story, though. For example, let's take these two. Vanguard Information Technology ETF. And then let's take XLK. And let's go over here and compare the two. So we'll do XLK and VGT. Now their expense ratios are similar. The assets that they manage are similar. But oh, here's a difference. XLK trades the Technology Select Sector Index, which is another way of saying it trades the S&P 500 technology companies. I don't know why they couldn't just say that. It's a lot easier. And in that category of technology companies in the S&P 500, they hold 73 different companies. Now, Vanguard does not trade only the S&P 500. They trade what's called the U.S. Investable Market, which means that it is the entire New York Stock Exchange, not just the S&P 500, and they trade all of the technology companies in that market. So we see right away, we went from 73 companies to 333 companies within this technology sector. Now, let's take a look at what that does to the returns. You see, in the long run, the returns are very, very similar. Because when it comes down to it, the S&P 500 is the 500 largest companies, so they're the 500 biggest hippos. You would expect for the big hippos, if they get in the pool, the water to rise. All right, I'm done with the deep voice. But the point is, you expect for the most movement in the market to be because of those 500 companies. So because of that, we see that a lot of the change or a lot of the price is centered or is in those 500 companies. But... Then there's the extra little guys that do make a difference over time. Where here we see in the one month, Vanguard outperformed XLK by 1.39%. Over three months, it outperformed it by 0.9%. In the year to date, it outperformed it by 63, or 0.63%. And it's about the same in the one year. Now, here's what I really want to show you guys, and this is where it gets fun. Let's look, let's look at what we have here. Let's compare apples to apples or Microsofts to Microsofts. We have, app, we have Apple and Apple, Microsoft, and oh my goodness, I'm going to stop trying to highlight things. Yep, definitely not going to highlight things. Microsoft and Microsoft, Visa, Visa, NVIDIA, NVIDIA, MasterCard, MasterCard, Salesforce. Okay, they swapped Salesforce and Adobe, but the percentages are about the same. So we're going to say they're on the same. Intel, PayPal, PayPal, Intel, and then Cisco. So the exact same 10 companies are in the top 10 holdings for both of these ETFs. And here's where we find our difference is this is how much these 10 companies are of their entire basket. So for XLK, which remember is only trading 73 technology companies in the S&P 500, it is 69.4% of their gift basket is these top 10 companies. For Vanguard, 
because they trade a bigger market, they trade 333 companies, we see that these 10 is only 61.8%. So there's about 8% difference between these two that is the other stuff. It's not that it's bad, it's just not that it's in the S&P 500. But that doesn't mean that it's not great. There are great companies in the New York Stock Exchange that are not in the S&P 500. So Vanguard gives you the opportunity to buy a gift basket with all of those. It may give you some new companies that you may not have known existed beforehand. So that is why comparing not just one ETF to another, but comparing a single market is very important. Because a single difference such as S&P 500 or New York Stock Exchange can result in, you know, not massive, but noticeable differences in price. So let's go back to here. Let's go back to ETFDB. Where now I want to show you what else you can find here. First thing we looked at was sectors. Now we can also look at industries, where we can say, I want to look, you know, clean energy. I, I really, I like going green. I like having solar. Solar is awesome. So I want to look at ETFs that trade something I like. Because investments are important because it is money. But it's nice to invest in companies or support companies that you believe in that you think they're doing something good with. So green energy is an ETF category that you can go out and buy and sell. So let's compare some, shall we? Let's compare iClean to PBW. So over here, we'll come back, ICLN. What was the other one? PBW. P, B, W, ah. there we go. So here we immediately see a difference. Our expense ratios, we were talking before about 0.09% or 0.15%. Now we're up at 0.46%, whereas P, B, W is 0.7%. And again, they trade slightly different indexes, so slightly different holdings. And the returns, because they're both trading similar markets, we'd expect to be the same, but it's not always the case. Where we are paying extra for this ETF, you pay a little bit more for higher quality. Where we can see here, while the one month and three month percent returns are comparable, in the year to date, one year, three year, and five year categories, PBW absolutely demolishes iClean. So this is why doing your research and comparing different ETFs is important. Because for some markets, such as between VOO and SPY, you won't find much of a difference. Other sectors will make much, or sorry, in other markets, you'll find a lot bigger of a difference between these ETFs. And now let's go down here and look at what they own. Because again, you may go into this knowing about, for example, SolarEdge. You may know that that was a company that existed, but maybe you didn't know what Sunrun was. Well, now you have another opportunity where you could say, okay, Sunrun. Let's go look at that, shall we? It is the ticker symbol RUN. All right, had a reversal today. Let's maybe keep an eye on it. And you can add it to your stock market list. So it's a great way of not only finding industries that have ETFs that you can invest in, but going and looking at their holdings to find new opportunities. So now let's go look at what I really want to share with you all, which is if we go here to tools, 
and we can go to indexes. And here we can choose different types of indexes. So let's first choose, because we talked about it before, leveraged. This can kind of be a little bit overwhelming, but what it goes through is all of the different indexes that we can track. So for example, you can buy, you can look at the index for the US dollar that are two times leveraged. So everything here is 2x leveraged. So every percent the index goes up, this market would go up 2%. So let's click into one of these. Here we see that this is the ProShares Ultra. Ultra will usually tell us that it is leveraged. What does it trade? It trades the euro. How much do they charge you? They charge you 1%. What do they track? They track the euro with a 2x leverage. So this is one rabbit hole. Let's go back for a second and let's go to something that we all may be a little bit more familiar with. Let's look here at equities. We will scroll down to building and construction, for example. Uh, no, let's go to let's go to a lot simpler one. Let's look at communications. We can click into S and P five hundred Telecom Select and see what options we have. Well, here we only have one choice, but we can see below other ETFs that track very, very similar ones, where here we have XTL trading telecommunications. This will be North American, so this will give you exposure to Canada and to Mexico, whereas this one is iShares offering for the same industry. Now, there's one more thing that I want to share with you all which is their ETF screener. This is my favorite way of seeing what options there are. Because here is where you can go in and look at different metrics or different things that you care about or that you would want to see. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to click on equities, which means that we want to look at companies. What type of companies? Well, we can look at large cap, mega cap, micro, so on and so forth. Say I want to invest in developing markets. You can find that here. Let's see, emerging markets, for example. We could look at emerging Asia Pacific. Or, and most importantly, say we want to look at a sector. Because we did our FinViz screener, we looked at what were the leading subsectors within the market. If you're interested to learn more about that, members, you have access to a members webinar, which I talk about subsectors and how you can compare subsectors within uh, FinViz's screener. If you found a leading subsector that you like, you can go in here. For example, I'm a nerd. I like video games. I'm going to click on gaming. Here are different options. There are two different ETFs that trade not only the video game industry, but the esports industry. So that is your like MLB, but for your kid's favorite video game. That is what this ETF is trading. Okay, maybe not everyone's cup of tea. Let's go look at consumer staples. Now here, we have all of our different consumer staples ETFs. And we can track them based on their returns, which is the clearest way of seeing which ones are doing the best in terms of profit, or say we want to find the best value. We can also compare their expenses. What do they charge you? 
Or what if we want to compare their holdings? Which ones offer the best diversity or the most, the, the most number of companies within their umbrella or within their basket? Sometimes you may only want to buy the highest quality ones. So you may look at, for example, RHS and XLP both trade 33 holdings in the consumer staples categories. So let's go compare these two. And this will be the last one that we look at before I open it up to questions. So we'll do XLP and, where'd it go? XLP and RHS. What'd you say? And here we can see what they look at. One of them trades the consumer staples category, and then one trades the S&P 500 consumers category, but equal weighted. What does that mean? It means that, say you have 10 different companies. Company one is the biggest. They, if you took all of the value of all of them, Company A had 25% of the value of that market. In an equal weighted market or equal weighted index, doesn't matter how much money each one of these companies have. Or think of it like this. You have Congress. The House of Representatives, you have representatives depending on how big your state is. The bigger the state, so for example, California has 53, because we're a very big state. But in the Senate, every state only has two. Doesn't matter if you are California or Rhode Island, you only have two. That is what equal weighted is. It's every company has one vote. So let's compare the return. Here we see that Staples has performed a lot better over time. And the reason is, is because in this case, the biggest companies are the ones that have been doing the best. So because of that, we expect to see that the one that gives more credit to the bigger companies will be the one to do better over time. And let's go look down here. This is where we see that equal weighted thing that I was talking about before come into play. Here we see Procter & Gamble 17.7%, Walmart's 10%, Coke is 9.8%, Pepsi is 9.6%. It is weighted based on how big these companies are. Over here... We see all of these percentages are very, very, very similar. It doesn't matter if you're Procter & Gamble or if you are Lamb Weston Holdings. You still get one vote. You are still about 3 point something percent of their portfolio. The last thing I want to show you is comparing a single ETF to a leveraged ETF. So to do that, I'm going to look here at SPY. Let's go find an S&P 500 leveraged ETF. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to go here. We are going to click on, believe there, no, it's not under sector. It should be under attributes. Two times leverage. And then let's choose one that represents the S&P 500, which is growth. No, blend. My apologies. Here we go. 
ProShares Ultra S&P 500, SSO. Now, here we see immediately what I talked about before, where because this is not just you set the machine to kind of do all the trades for you, it requires a lot more management. And we'll take a look at why in just a moment here. These both trade the exact same index, the S&P 500. And here we can see their returns. Where it's kind of been all over the place because while SPY is very, very straightforward, it just trades the index, this one, leverage requires a lot more effort. It requires special styles of investing called options or um, other types of debt collection in order to give you that leverage. It's not just they make money magically appear. They need to create that value from somewhere. So while we see, for example, today, this one went up by 0.9%. Our two times leveraged ETF went up by 1.8%. So that's what you expect to see. But here we see in March when the market went all whatever the heck the market did in April and March, our two times leveraged ETF got hit much harder than the normal market did. And here is the important part. Why is the data not available? Darn. Here we can see the biggest difference where this company or where SPY owns Apple, Microsoft, and all of these, the vast majority of SSO's holdings is in dollars or they're in other types of what are called derivative investments. So these are going to be their options. These are going to be their shorts. This is going to be their um, Debts. This is where they make that two times leverage come from. Again, they're not printing money. They use other types of investing, so you don't, to give you the option of buying something that is two times more risk, but two times more reward. So let's quickly review. ETF.com is a great option for comparing two ETFs by going to ETF Tools and Data an ETF comparison tool. ETFDB.com is a great resource for finding what options you have. You can start in the database if you want to look at a specific index to find what ETFs are in that index. Or you can use their ETF screener if you already know where you're looking and want to just narrow down the options where you can compare returns, expenses, dividends, holdings, and more, all in one easy to find place. And then once you find your options, you can go over to the ETF comparison tool and see how they've done over time. Thank you guys all for joining us for today. It was a lot of information, but hopefully there was something that you picked up on today that you can start to implement in your own trading strategies. Again, for all of those that are interested, Julie Staub, my mother, will be holding some investment classes here in the near future starting on October 20th. So you can see how ETF investing can make trading easier and different and how they can be used in different horizons of trading, whether you want to trade daily, weekly, every two weeks, or even monthly. How sectors make it easy to find your opportunities and make finding those opportunities and trading on those opportunities that much simpler. So again, if you're interested to learn more about that, take a look at last Friday's free webinar in which we talked about all of what will be covered in those classes the cost for them, and how you can get involved. I will post the link in chat right now for the orientation. So if you're interested to learn more, I recommend taking a look at that video. If you have any questions, please feel free to send your questions to support at sectorsmadesimple.com. And from all of us here, 
Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you all very, very soon. Take care, everybody.